So All right. Just your name and you okay. Know, what you yeah, I'm I'm Jack Hawkins. I was in Vietnam in August 1968 to August of 69. Uh, I grew up on a big ranch in Higgins, Texas, and uh, went to flight school. This was went into the army in in 1967, and I'd always wanted to fly. And this was, I guess, the opportunity that I had. Went to the 119th, uh, got into the company, like I said, in August of 68. Uh, was a Peter pilot and made AC sometime in November of 1968. Uh, a lot of our missions that we had and the missions that I really like to fly was LERP insertions. This would be like four or five guys that we would put into the jungle and they would stay out for probably four to five, four to five days. And they, they tried to avoid contact with any of the bad guys but just to report and see what they had and movement and, and all that. When I first got into the country, they, we were flying a FOB mission and that was over into Laos and Cambodia. And I went over there a few times and as a Peter pilot, I didn't know a whole lot of what was going on, but uh, I remember one time it was a, a hot, a hot extraction and they got everybody out and that is what is amazing with the guns and the covers that and, and I was a slick pilot the uh, when, when the guns would roll in that usually gave the slicks enough time to get in and, and to get out uh, in the same way with the LERPs, whenever we had a LERP insertion or extraction, we always had the guns. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing this interview for Andrew Garrison, the, the son of Pigpen, a uh, real name, Mark Garrison. Pigpen got into uh, country about a month after, after I did. Okay. And he was a slick pilot for a while. He was in the yellow flight, I was in the blue flight. And, and it's really strange in the company, the flights kind of all stayed together. It, we didn't intermingle all that much. And like the yellow flight, I think most of their missions was down, more down towards what, the, with, towards the oasis uh, blue flights, we always flew up more towards Docto, and I may be wrong on this, the yellow flight flew up in that area also. Um, it, it's interesting to hear like about the, the LERP insertions, and as I know my dad wasn't a big fan of doing LERP insertions. <laughs> he, he said he do, did some of those, and going through the triple canopy. I, and, and, and I'll tell you why I really like the, the LERP insertion, and something I learned, this was when I was a Peter pilot, we were doing a LERP extraction. There were, I think, four on the ground, and it was hot. Uh, the guns w were rolling in, and they were trying to get to a pickup LZ where we could get them out. And, it, and I distinctly remember, and I don't remember the direction, but the LERPs told the extraction aircraft, don't come on the east side of the LZ, that's where the bad guys are. Well, he came from the east side of the LZ. He got shot up. He got shot into the arm. Uh, they shot, uh, it may have been a transmission oil line or something out, and he got, got away from the LZ. We chased him until he crashed. And at the same time, there was a, a bird dog, and that's a, I don't know, what the bird dog was. It's not an old one, I, I don't remember, but it's a small, small fixed wing. Okay. Well, he got shot down. And when we were chasing, 
the the slick that was down and he didn't didn't get the lerps out the bird dog was gliding had engine out and he managed to get it into Ben Head. And when he landed that aircraft on the strip at Ben Head, I think I could run faster than what his, his landing speed was. Well, then we went back and we picked up the lerps and we could only get down to where they could just barely reach the skid. Uh, this is mountainous, mountainous area and I, I can remember I was a Peter pilot then, and I was over here winding the clock, trying to stay busy. And I can remember throwing their M16 up there, grabbing the skid, and getting in. So we we got we got them out. Next day, we were putting in some lerps, and I looked back, and it was one of the same guys. And I said, "What are you doing back?" He said. I hate being around base camp. I'd rather be out, out in the woods. Reason I like the LERPs, the LERPs would tell you what was going on. They wouldn't, they wouldn't tell you, yeah, come on in, it's, it's fine. If it was bad, they would tell you. They were, yeah. they, they were very good. Yeah. Uh, I made AC in sometime in November and we lost a crew just right about the time that, that I made AC. Uh, and it, it, that was from, from the second, second flight. And so things went on and just normal. We had a lot of combat as, assaults. The, uh, the, 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 the guns and, and we really liked like the, the croc guns for cover and and actually the, in the charlie models and we use some of the other companies another company that we occasionally would cover it were the cougars and they were out of contoon and they gave good good cover and they would get down and, and dirty they would get down and, and mix it up the Occasionally, we would use Cobras as a cover, but it was not the same. And one of the one of the things with the Charlie model gunship that had a big advantage over a Cobra is they would be. And here I am, a slick pilot, telling you tactics on a gun pilot. But this this is you can ask any of them when they would break they would have their crew chief and gunner that had M60s. So when they were break, their crew chief and gunner could could cover sure. cover any, any of their breaks. So we, th th they were good. And, and the, the people that, uh, that really taught us how to fly had been through Ted of 68. And Ted of 68 was, was pretty bad. And they were good, and they had been on this FOB for like two months, and that was always a dicey operation. And so I would have to say that we, my first 300 hours in Vietnam is when I learned how to fly. I had 210 hours or whatever it was through flight school, sure. but the first 300 hours in Vietnam it, um, you didn't fly the helicopter, you got in, and the way I would describe it, you got in and you strapped a helicopter to your back. <laughs> and yeah. and it went, went where you was. Yeah. One of the things I would like to say, I had a really good crew chief and gunner, uh, Robert Legacy and John Morrison, Robert, Legacy is still is still living. Morrison's deceased, and never once did they ever question a decision whether we were going to go in and pick up somebody or not. And and I think that probably was was the same situation throughout the whole company. The crew members. Never, never, never questioned. They, they were. They're all on board. 
they, they were with you. That's great. What was it like back in the back of the hooch after the missions? You guys were. You know, it. Um, I, I flew like twelve hundred and fifty hours in Vietnam. Of course, when I got there, there was a typhoon going on. So for like a week, we were shut down. Then as a Peter pilot, I didn't fly that much. But once the dry season started, and I think the dry season probably started in maybe November through 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 the, you know, spring until the next year, late summers when the monsoons would start, we were we we were flying a, a lot. It was there was we would have a lot of six and seven hour days of flying. Um, technically, a hundred and forty hours. I think it was one hundred and forty hours. Either one hundred and twenty or one hundred and forty hours was a maximum that you could have in a thirty day period. And now that's one thing the slicks did more. We got a lot more time than the guns. Um, a lot of times the guns would be, they would, they would stage and they'd wait for something or other to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, either uh, somebody in, in the field, an infantry unit calling for, for some gun support or, uh, uh, or, or a LERP insertion or a combat assault or something other. So they, I, I, I may be wrong on this and you may ask your dad, but I think probably five or 600 hours would be a pretty high time for a gun gun pilot. But you'll you'll need to check yeah. with one of them on that. Over that's, there, over the that's, year period and while you're over there? And, and so a lot of times when you get back to the hooch and that's, that is one of the things I always said about, well, the bad part of the war was it started too early in the morning and, and ended too late in the afternoon because we were always out pre-flighting before dawn and a lot of times we would be taken off just right at, at, at sunup. So a lot of times when we'd get back to the hooch, we'd have sea rations to eat. Like during March, I know I had like 170 hours in a 30 day period flying during during March and it was every day and about every other day there were three or four of us uh, that would have to go and see the flight surgeon like every other day and look at us in the eyes and you know our eyes were still focused and and he'd sign us off for another day and when you're getting when you get up that that high, even if you have a day off, it you you just can't get your flight time down because you'd have to have four or five days off in a row, sure. and we we couldn't get our flight time down. This was during the Task Force Alpha. He said in, in March. Okay, guess, and know. that's that is that was in March. It it uh, we put a. A, a company into, uh, and I think it's Hill 467 is what they call it. And we call it Task Force Alpha because they brought partial, uh, they brought Alpha Company in and actually there was, uh, I think Bravo Company occasionally was in and out, but it was on a small hilltop in the Play Trap Valley. And we put them in on March the 1st, and for 30 days, they went through pure hell. Yeah. It, uh, I have hooked up with, with quite a few of the guys of the Charlie Company, uh, and I think it was the 1st of the 8th of the 4th. They brought Alpha Company in, what was left. Alpha Company had got ambushed on a ridge top and it just really wiped out probably half the company, it had a lot, a lot of casualties. So the remnants of Alpha Company, they brought into Task Force Alpha. And going in, into that place and what it was, there was a regiment that was of NVA. And I think a regiment had around 800 men in it. I, it to the best of my 
recollection is a reg a NVA regiment was around 800. And the 467 was just just a little 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 hill, uh, you know, uh, above. I and I can remember going in during during the time you know resupplying them, and what what they would want they would ammunition and water, and it got to where. They were surrounded. They couldn't even get down to the creek to to get water, and they were just really. And we'd haul water in in these big metal containers, which is they weigh a lot, which is a terrible way to transport water. But sure. that's what we did. And I went in one time, and they have a pad. Uh, they actually did some sandbags, and they had a pad in the bunker. Was was right here. Well, just as I landed, when mortars started coming in, and I was loaded with ammunition and and water, and I didn't want to have to have to leave. And the guy in the uh, on the the RTO was telling me, "Get out of here! Get out of here!" And my crew chief and gunner boy, they were throwing that stuff off. And right right in front of our pad was where a mortar round had, had gone off. You could see that in the dirt where a mortar round had, had gone off. The mortars were coming in, they threw that stuff off in probably 20 seconds, 30 seconds at the max. Two guys jumped on and, and off we went. And I, I didn't take any hits. I, you know, and I, I really never, took many hits. As far as I know, I only took one hit and that was on the extraction of Task Force Alpha. And, and why? I, it just, you know, I did the lerps and, and everything, but I think a big part of it was that, that I learned from that initial lerp extraction if they say the bad guys are on this side, come in from the other side, yeah. you know? And that was one thing with the guns that they 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 tried not to do was to overfly where, you know, the where, where they were receiving fire. They would break before before that and where their their gunner could carry them. When we extracted, it was on March the 30th, the Task Force Alpha, it was a company-wide extraction. And a, a good friend of mine, we had a really good platoon leader. Uh, his name was Bob Nelius. I'm not gonna tell you what his nickname was. You can ask your team. It's, it's in the ask, combat audio. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can ask, ask, his dad, ask your dad what his nickname was. But Bob was a great, platoon leader. I think he wound up flying over 1,400 hours in Vietnam. And I know the company commander told him one time, you know, you need to stay back at the hooch and there's some OERs and stuff. And he said, sir, he said, my job is out, out with the guys. He said, that's, that's where I'm going to be. Awesome. And he was. And then another really good guy who was ex special forces. He he was down at a place in Duco. His name was Jim Hudkins. We called him Hud. Boy, he he he, he was good. And of course, he knew what it was like to be on the ground. And he was in special forces, and he got wounded. And it would probably be in '63 or so. It was early on before, you know, they had much, much uh, helicopter support. And the the day that we extracted company-wide, HUD and I, there were several of us had been in three times. And uh, so we we were taking them back to Polly Clang. And by that time, your dad, he had already, he'd gotten shot up uh 
the, it, that was one of the guns that, that got shut up really bad. There was a pair of Cougar uh, Charlie models that came out of the 57th. One of them got his windscreen shot out. Uh, one guy was windy. He was in the first flight. He took a 50 cal round through his transmission and got a transmission line or something or other. He lost his, his transmission oil pressure, which it's not going to run long without oil. And uh, I chased him, but he managed to, to land to get it to Firebase 29. And then Melius, he got shot up and he had to take his aircraft back. And I think we had nine aircraft that got shot up or that took hits that day. Uh, so we came back to Polyclang and the, the ones that were left, we had to refuel. And so we took off and there was probably about four or five of us that we took off. We still had, I know one croc gun and he may have teamed up with the, the other Cougar, Cougar, but that was, his name was Waldo. Oh, yeah. Waldo was, was, was good too. And, and so we took off and Hud said, well, there's nine, nine left. He said, I'll go pick up five who'll go and pick up the last four. And man, I did not want to have to go back in there, but I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go and get them. Well, I, I have a hard time. Give, give me just a second here. Sure, absolutely. Take your time. Hud, Hud went and, and got the five, and he got shot up, got shot up pretty bad. And I was getting ready to go in. I, and I said, three things, a large prayer, 23rd Psalms, and the affirmation of faith. I, I did not see any way I was gonna get in and get out. I believe in guardian angels and I could tell you several stories on that and I believe in miracles. Well at that time two calf cobras showed up. They both had full rocket pods. That's 96 rockets between them. And they said y'all need some help and yes sir we, we sure would appreciate it. And I went in uh, I made it in got the other four and got out and I took one round. I think the miracle was that that the the bad guys knew that it was getting low and when they saw saw the the, the cobras, the cobras had a lot more firepower than than that. In 96 rockets they could have really peppered uh, around that. And I, I would say that was a miracle. Uh, I, I met with it, the one of the last guys out. It was his name was Homer Steadley. He was a lieutenant, and he had a, a medic and a RTO and and one of his platoon sergeants. And those those nine, the the five that Hood picked up and. The four that we picked up, the the colonel had told him that uh, the helicopters aren't going to go in. It's you know, it's you guys are going to have to E and E, and that was like a, a death sentence to him. Well, later on, I met with uh, with Homer, and he said, and there that bunker where we had land by, landed was filled with mortar rounds, claymores you know, all their ammunition and everything. 
And Omer said, did you know that we had already set fuses in, in there to blow that stuff up? You know, and it's, you know, it, it's right right there. And I said, no, I didn't, but if I had of you'd still be, you'd still had to walk. <laughs> you would have had to walk out. But he said, yeah, he said, I, I loaded that thing with all kinds of fuses to blow it up. He said, they, they weren't going to find them all. And, and I, so I, and I guess after we pulled out that it, it did. Wow. Amazing. How, how many trips did you make? Uh, to the LZ that day. Four. Hud and I did four. And uh, and here he comes. Crop three. Crop two. Crop two. <laughs> yeah. All right. Come here. Is he telling you a bunch of lies about me, Andy? He's well, I, no. I it, all the Crocs. Everybody. Everybody in general. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they were good. <laughs> no, no, the Mark. You know, we 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 had good support, and you asked like what was life like back in the hooch, and I told you the 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 two platoons and the crops. You'd get back. We all had a. Had a place where we could sit down. Uh, had a like in our hooch. There were like four or five rooms on one side and four or five rooms on the other. And there was a, an area in the middle that had some chairs and a refrigerator. And a lounge. Kept, a lounge, kind of a, a, a lounge thing. And it it uh, the second flight we kind of stayed there. First flight there in the in the crocs crocs there. Uh, I I would say when we got back, you know, we would go and possibly go and eat with the Crocs, but back at 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 the base, everybody kind of was with their own. Yeah, group. that's right. They said it, but but once you got in the field, it was yeah, we we were together. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, you needed to prepare for tomorrow and the next day and your missions, you know, and, and stay cognizant of what the hell you were doing. And everybody just kind of stayed with their own unit. Yeah. Like he said, though, when, when there was a big operation or something, everybody pulled together. Yeah, it, it was. It, it, it was. We had a good company. Uh, we, it was, we actually, when I was there, we lost one crew. And then on March the 1st, Whenever we were went into the play trap valley, yeah. we had a uh, crew chief that got that got killed. He uh, he got shot in the throat right above right above his chicken plate. What was his name? Uh, it was a German name. I, I can't Did remember. Did he kill him? Huh? Did he kill him? Yeah. Oh yeah. He was on uh, Thunder's Thunder's aircraft. Uh, Thunder Thornton. Yeah. And I know that he had just had a son. Uh -huh. Did you wear the chicken plate much? I wore the chicken plate all the time. So did I. Yeah. The one time I didn't put it on after I was an AC and I didn't put my flak vest on or anything. We got a, a call to scramble at, at Suey Dewey that I was talking about last night. And we we were really in a rush. They were in a firefight. I jumped in the aircraft and cranked it and went, and I realized I didn't have my chicken plate or flight vest on. And during that, on the way back, after we fired, the guns were hotter than hell in the M60s. Yeah. And this guy brought his gun in instead of giving out the door, the gunner, and it cooked off one and hit me in the back. Oh! It broke a couple ribs, believe it or not. Yep. I didn't have that flak vest or chicken plate on it. And there was no cushion when it hit me. And that thing just hit me. Oh, it, in the seat? Yeah. Ooh. It hit me right in the back, and it, it, it had fabric and everything else, but it just slammed like a slam. It was, it was an armored seat. The seat weighed 140 yeah. pounds. And it just knocked the shit out of it. Yeah. And uh, that's the one time I... I wrote the word again after that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you, there, no, there's one time I didn't. 
we were all parked at Polly Kling, and this was in March also. March was a tough month. No kidding. 